Episode 31, September the 10th, 1914. The Day We Forced the Passage of the Marne by A. A. Martin, MC, CHB, FRCS. ED. Read by Mike Holding. Dr. Martin, who had seen active service in South Africa in 1901, was in 1914 attached to the field ambulance of the 5th Division. In telling phrases, he recounts his experiences on the day when the victorious British Army crossed the Marne. He had unequalled opportunity of watching the exciting incidents of an historic advance. Columiers at this time looked a little bit dégagé. It had been occupied by the Germans some days previously, and now the British had it. The French inhabitants were in Paris. The narrow old streets looked very cheerful and inviting when I passed through, for our army servicemen had several fires merrily blazing at the side of the pavé, and the smell of frying bacon and roasting coffee beans was inviting and appetising. Signs of the German occupation were everywhere apparent. Round the ashes of their fires in the side streets and square were the charred remains of old and valuable furniture, a carved leg of an old chair, a piece of the frame of a big mirror, a bit of a door, and so on. I think the German soldier enjoyed the novel sensation of cooking his food over burning cabinets and tables and chairs made in the times of the Louis of France. Our men were extremely careful to avoid damage to French property and made their fires of chopped wood logs. Tommy has good feelings and is always a gentleman, and he genuinely pitied the French and their despoiled towns. My orders were to report to the principal medical officer of the 5th Division of the 2nd Army. The headquarters of General Smith Dorian, the commander of the 2nd Army, was a little cluster of houses by the roadside, and when we arrived the whole staff were standing by the road, while the grooms stood near holding their horses. Smith Dorian, with another staff officer, was poring over a map and indicating some spot on it with his finger. The principal medical officer, Colonel Porter, of the Army Medical Staff, was just coming out of a cottage, and I walked up, saluted, and reported my arrival. The colonel gave me a cheery greeting, asked if I had breakfasted, and noticing the South African war ribbon on my tunic, said that as I had seen service before, I would soon be quite at home. I was then told to report to the officer commanding a section of the 15th Field Ambulance, which was lying about 500 yards further down the road. I reported to Major O of the Royal Army Medical Corps, who told me that he was waiting to evacuate some wounded to Columiers before moving up to rejoin the headquarters of the ambulance, which was advancing with the 15th Infantry Brigade. There were 16 wounded British in a small farmhouse beside the road. They were lying on straw on the floor, and the wounds of all of them had been dressed. When I entered, they were drinking milk, supplied by the old farmer and his wife. This old farmhouse had been occupied by the Germans two days previously, and the old farmer brought me through the house to show me what the Huns had done. His two wooden bedsteads had been smashed. All his wife's clothes had been taken out of a chest of drawers and torn up, and the chest had been battered badly with an axe. The windows were broken, and two legs of the kitchen table had been chopped off. An old family clock lay battered in a corner, and an ancient sporting gun was broken in two. The farmer showed me one of his wife's old bonnets, which had been thrown into the fire by these lovely Germans and partially burned. Fancy burning an old woman's bonnet. Two German soldiers got into the fowl yard, 
and struck all the birds down with their bayonets. A fine Normandy dog lay dead at the garden gate, shot by a German non-commissioned officer because the poor beast barked at him. The old-fashioned furniture and adornments of the house had been destroyed. All the pictures were broken except two. One of these was a framed picture of Pope Leo XIII, and the other one represented the crucifixion. We guess that the German troops must have been Bavarians, who were mostly Catholic. I've described this wrecked home as it was typical of hundreds of others that I've seen in France. It all seemed so stupid, so senseless, so paltry and mean. Conceive the frightfulness of burning an old lady's bonnet and smashing an old clock that had been in the family's possession for three generations and had ticked the minutes to the farmer's folk and whose face had been looked at by those long since dead. The old farmer was in tears and very miserable. He said that the German soldiers were very drunk and had bought a lot of bottles of champagne with them, round which they spent a very hilarious night. One of the men had a very fine voice and sang a German drinking song, while the others hiccuped the chorus. There were certainly a lot of empty champagne bottles lying about, and I don't think the old farmer's beverage ever soared above vin rouge, so the bottles must have been German loot. About eleven o'clock, while we were still waiting for returning empty supply wagons to take off our wounded, we heard that some German prisoners were being marched in. This caused some excitement, and speaking for myself, I was consumed with curiosity to see some specimens of this great German army and observe what manner of men they were. Under a strong guard of cavalry, 300 prisoners with about 10 officers were marched into a field close to our farmhouse. It was laughable to see our old farmer. He rushed frantically up the road, his eyes blazing with excitement and joy, and stood gazing at his country's enemies with an expression of malicious joy and delight. I was struck with the appearance of these prisoners. They were very tired, absolutely done in, and marched along the road with a most bedraggled and weary step. Were these the men who had used stepped through Belgium's stately capital and had pushed the united armies of France and England before them, in one of the most rapid marches in history? They were utterly broken down with fatigue, and their famished expression and wolfish eyes betokened the hardships they had recently undergone. When they were halted in the field, they simply rolled onto the ground in sheer exhaustion. On looking closer, however, one could see they were fine soldiers, athletic, well-built, lean, wiry fellows, with shaven heads and prominent features, slim-waisted and broad-shouldered, clothed in smart, well-fitting, bluish-grey uniforms, well-shod with good serviceable boots, each with a light water bottle clipped to his belt and a haversack over the shoulder. Certainly no fault could be found with them as specimens of muscular and active soldiery. Officers, disdaining to show fatigue, sat by themselves in a group apart and smoked pipes and cigarettes. The famished men were supplied with British bully beef and biscuits and buckets of water were brought to them for drink. They at once threw off their exhaustion and simply rushed the food. We realised that they had been marched to a stop and that the commissariat of that particular army corps must have broken down. The augury was a good one. Shortly after the arrival of the guard jagas, some empty motor supply wagons returning from the front were stopped. We packed plenty of straw on them and put our wounded British and Germans comfortably on top and sent them all off to the hospital train at Columiers. Then our commanding officer, Major O, gave the order to our ambulance drivers to harness up the horses and prepare to trek. We knew that our army was making a stand at last and that the long retreat was over.
All the morning heavy firing was heard on our front towards the River Marne, and we were not sure what was happening. We knew that our cavalry was at work somewhere, for the guard jagas had been bagged by our horsemen, but more than that we did not know. However, we were soon on the road, and following Napoleon's maxim to his generals, always to march on the firing. The roads were terribly dusty, the day was hot and sultry, and a blazing sun beat mercilessly down upon us. We all cursed our caps, and certainly the khaki cap supplied to our officers and men deserved a curse. It gave no protection to the head or neck in summer, and in rainy weather it was soon soaked. Marching on foot behind lumbering ambulance wagons on a dusty road and under a hot sun is no picnic. Eyes get full of dust, throats get parched, feet get hot and the khaki uniform wraps round one like a sticky blanket. So for many miles we marched, and all the time the sound of the guns became more and more distinct and intense. We passed saint ouen and by Saint-Cyr, and at 4.30 o'clock we seemed to be in the centre of the artillery thunder area. Great guns were screeching and roaring all around us, and some of the enemy's shells were bursting to our left front, near the road along which we were moving. We were then ordered to pull our wagons off the road and bivouac them under a clump of trees near at hand, in order to conceal them from enemy aeroplanes, which were hovering high up in the blue. The reason for at times concealing a field ambulance is that when a column is on the march, the field ambulance has a definite position in the column. Generally it is behind the ammunition column. The ambulance wagons with their big white tented covers and conspicuous red crosses are often the most prominent features on the road. The enemy flying man, when he sees a field ambulance, knows that there is at least a brigade, consisting of four battalions and an ammunition column in front of it, and he can then direct his gunners to plant their shells in front of the ambulance and so get the ammunition column and the brigade. Hence the necessity for sometimes hiding the whereabouts of a field ambulance. After we had bivouacked, our section cook managed to light a fire in a hollow in a clump of trees and soon brought us a much-desired mess of fried mutton, good bread and marmalade and a can of tea. We rushed this as badly as the German prisoners did the bully beef earlier in the day. In a battle one really sees very little and knows very little of what is going on except in the near neighbourhood. The broad perspective, the great view of a battle, cannot be seen by one pair of eyes. This can only be understood and appreciated afterwards, when facts and events are gathered together and dovetailed to form the battle story. When I was sitting by the roadside on this August afternoon amidst the crashing and shrieking of the guns, the bursting of the shells, the curious crackling of the rifles, and the snarling notes of the machine guns, I guessed that a battle was in progress and that we were blazing furiously at an enemy who was blazing furiously back at us. Beyond that, I did not know very much. During the night, I learned a good deal more of the day's events, but the whole story was not connected up till many days afterwards. I'm quite sure that the people of London knew more about the Battle of the Marne from the war bulletins than I did, although I was one of the humble units present in the actual fighting. On this sultry summer day, our ambulance section was resting by the side of the dusty road that stretched in our rear towards Paris and on our front towards a lovely green valley at the bottom of which meandered the River Marne. It wound its sinuous way from our far right to our near left. Directly before us and on the distant side of the river was a steep ridge, part of a low chain of uplands which rolled hazily away to the right and stopped abruptly in clear-cut lines in our front. 
The road beside which we sat dipped into the valley and crossed the river on a fine stone bridge and continued through the undulating country beyond to the north. Small villages were scattered about, Meiri to the right, Sasse at the bridgehead, and small clusters of houses and farms on the countryside over the river. Some squadrons of dismounted cavalrymen were standing by their horses in a meadow near the bank of the river. These horsemen had been busy earlier in the day and had done some hard riding, cutting off stragglers from the retreating German army corps. Infantry were hidden from view in the depths of the valley. Batteries on our left were sending a plunging fire of shot and shell onto the ridge and dips beyond the river and the road leading from the bridge. With a field glass, moving dots and what looked like wagons could be made out on the road and the field alongside. It was on these moving dots that our guns played, and cloud bursts of earth and dust showed that our gunners had the range beautifully. General French passed us twice in his limousine car, General Smith Dorian passed twice. General Sir Charles Ferguson passed, all in motor cars, travelling like mad. Gallopers with messages spurred up and down the road. Guns thundered into position, unlimbered and were quickly in action. Infantry marching rapidly passed down the road into the valley, where a tornado of rifle fire was going on. One could make out the distinct note from our own rifles and the muffled one from the more distant German Mausers. Two German shells burst short of the battery on our left and uncomfortably close to us. We were in an odd position for an ambulance in front of our own battery, which was pelting shot into the Germans and which a German battery was trying to locate. When the enemy shells fell short, they fell near us. Our position, however, was a dress circle box seat as a viewpoint, so we stopped where we were. It was not every day that one could look on a real live battle. Before dusk came on, an aeroplane appeared over the ridge, flying towards us, and was shot at by enemy aircraft guns. The shells burst all around it, but it sailed triumphantly through them all, and to our intense relief landed safely in our lines, with some valuable information. When the action was at its hottest and every gun was busy, a car raced up from the valley in a swirling cloud of dust. The brakes were jammed hard down opposite us, the side door opened. Out stepped a well-knit, muscular, lithe figure looking physically fit, smart and cool, in a well-made khaki uniform and red-banded cap. The face was a burnt brick red, the moustache white, the eyes alert, wide open and knowing. A savage, obstinate, determined chin dominated the face. It was the chin of a strong, stubborn nature, the chin of a prize fighter. This was Smith Dorian, the commander of the Second Army Corps, and at this moment the Second Corps was at grips with the enemy. With a few rapid strides he'd reached the battery on our left, asked some question of the battery commander and at once clapped field glasses to his eyes and gazed long and intently at a spot on the other side of the valley pointed out to him by the battery commander. Our party of officers filled with curiosity also got out field glasses and focused in the same direction. Our shells could be seen bursting on a far ridge and after a long stare we managed to make out what we thought were some guns but we were not sure. A few words to the battery commander, a careless salute, and Smith Dorian was back in his car, which was rapidly turned and disappeared eyes out down the dusty road up which it had but just come. As the car disappeared, a tremendous rifle fire broke out all along the valley beyond the stream. It made one's pulses beat with excitement. The Second Army Corps was fighting hard in the valley at our feet, and Smith Dorian was down in the valley with his men. When the Devil's Din was at its loudest, another powerful limousine 
coming from the rear, pulled up opposite us. Go on, go on, shouted a voice from the inside, and the car again sped on. Inside was Field Marshal Sir John French, poring over a map, held out with both hands over his knees. His car also disappeared into the valley, and we again surmised that there must be some big thing going on down below. To draw thither, Field Marshal, Corps Commanders and Divisional Generals. An hour elapsed. All of the batteries except one had ceased fire. The cracking of our rifles was still heavy but more distant, and now two cars were seen coming slowly towards us from out the valley. In the front car were French and Smith Dorian. We augured that all was well, for the car was proceeding slowly, and the field marshal placidly smoking a cigar. Our augury was correct. We had forced the passage of the Marne and were grimly in pursuit of the retreating foe.